Right, so we've been looking at um, generation, actually, alternative ways of generating and how we can actually link things up like wave power, water power, gravity, loads of ways. And we've been doing it from scavenging bits and pieces that we can find around us. And that's kind of awesome because you, you learn a lot and you learn an awful lot about motors. Now, there are basically two kinds of motors, ones with magnets in them and ones without magnets in them. The easiest one to use are going to be the ones with magnets. You have to do the least work on those. If you're using ones without magnets, you've got to do something to magnetise it, or there's some residual magnetism you can use. So we've been looking at a whole range, and if you're interested in that, have a look at some of the um, videos that I've done on adapting motors. On this one, we're going to talk about a specific kind of motor. And the reason we're going to talk about this is because there are two things involved when you're generating. That is, the force that you apply to it to turn it. So the bigger the generator, you're going to have to apply more force, obviously. And the other thing is the speed at which it turns. Now, we've done a little bit on gears, and we know that if we gear something, then we can turn it very quickly, but we need to apply a greater force. So you find a lot of motors will need a gearing setup to get any usable power out of them. And this tends to be true for a straightforward DC motor. It's particularly true for things like adapted alternators or adapted universal motors. But there is one set of motors where it's not true, and these are stepper motors. Actually, stepper motors are really quite interesting things, and one of the good things about them is when you turn them quite slowly, they actually give a really high voltage output, so they can be very, very useful for that. Now, stepper motors and brushless motors are the ones that you're going to find in the microgenerators. So if you're looking at a wind microgenerator on eBay and thinking about taking it backpacking to charge your phone, there's a very high chance it's either running off a stepper motor or it's running off a brushless motor. The commercial ones tend to be brushless motors. The DIY home ones tend to be stepper motors. And there's a reason for that. You can attach something directly to the spindle, get it to turn, and even if it's turned slowly, it'll have a decent voltage output. And so it makes the construction of the whole thing much easier when you're constructing the whole unit. The only slight problem with them is working out what's inside and then how it is that you can change that. So the video is going to be about how it is that we need to adapt a stepper motor into a generator. Anyway, let's have a look at a few stepper motors close up. So here's a fine example of a stepper motor, and they come in a whole range of sizes. So you can get really small ones, and you can get big ones, and get absolutely massive ones. You can either buy them, I've clearly bought these, or you can scavenge them for things like printers. So if you have a look around in a printer, you'll find some stepper motors that you can use. We're going to use this one because it's a nice, brand new, bought in, and so we won't have any surprises. Now we're going to need to attach to the spindle to get it to turn, and the good thing about the bought in ones uh, you can get all kinds of spindles and attachments. These are actually from a um, CNC machine, and so it has a little spindle that goes on that drives a toothed belt. Kind of awesome, makes the project really, really easy. So there's an example of some stepper motors, but they come in a whole range of types. Here's one, it's an extremely popular stepper motor. It's a 28BYJ. It's a geared stepper motor, so you've got some gears in here, and that makes that quite hard to turn. But if you put a crank handle on that, that'll output a surprising amount of voltage. So you can buy them as a package like that, or you can buy them like that, or you can buy them in a whole range of ways. This is a stepper motor, incidentally. I took this from the CD-ROM drive. If you're interested in how I got this, just review the video, and you can see that that's a nice little stepper motor. Now, most stepper motors, you'll notice, come with a range of wires, and there's four on them. So we have four wires coming out of that stepper motor. Now, when we look at the wiring, the stepper motor actually looks like this. So those four wires, in fact, just go to two separate coils, and we can identify those just by checking it of the resistance with a digital multimeter. When you've got the right coils, you'll have a fixed resistance of some value. Quite often it says on the stepper motor what that resistance value will be, and it depends on the size of the motor, but you'll get some resistance value.
When you get two wires that are not part of the same coil, the resistance will be infinite because they're not connected. So it's really easy to identify which wires they are. And I've done that and I've just knotted one together to tell me that those two wires belong to one coil and those two wires belong to the other coil. So it's very easy to identify which two wires it is that you're looking at. Sometimes, of course, you get the motor like this, which has got a pin connection. If you have a pin connection, you'll need the connecting wire and do exactly the same thing. Here, when we're looking at this one, we can see the four dots on it with the four connections. That would be where we soldered to, and then we'd identify which coil it was, and we could use that as a generator by spinning that. This one's a bit unusual, and I thought I'd actually go into it, because uh, it's got five wires on it, and that can be a bit confusing. This one's actually really good because you can find the pinout diagram really, really easily for it just by doing a search under the name and pinout. And it will tell you that the actual wiring looks like this. So you can see that, in fact, the two end coils are two of these wires and the red one actually taps off the center of each which is quite curious so we will ignore the red and just attach to the two other two wires and it will be exactly the same as this one which is really cool now in order to get this out what we'll actually have is an ac output and that's not a bad thing in itself but more often than not you want a dc output in order to get dc output we need a bridge rectifier now a bridge rectifier is a whole host of things either you can make it and it looks like this. As you can see, it's basically just four diodes and a little ring. Those diodes can be any number, and there's a really popular one, the 1N4007, which is just going to handle it just fine. You can use a 1N34, which is a very low voltage drop, and you might use that for something tiny like that. But the silicon diode is going to be fine like that. Or you can buy a rectifier as a single piece. There is something called a MOSFET bridge diode, and I might do a separate video on that, because it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, but worth looking at, certainly, and I'll probably do a video on it later. What we're going to do is we're going to build two diodes and attach them to each of the coil. Then we need to connect the coil together. Now, when we generate from this, what we're actually going to do is store that energy in a capacitor. So we're going to charge a capacitor up and we can use the capacitor to deliver the power. And the circuit that we're going to use looks like this. Now we obviously have a choice, we can uh, connect that up in parallel or we can connect that up in series. If we connect it up in parallel, we'll have the same voltage, but we'll have more amps. If we connect it in series, we'll have the same amps, but more voltage. It just depends what you want. So the first thing to do is to build those bridge rectifiers. Okay, so this is what a diode looks like and its circuit diagram. So here's some 1N4007s in real life, and as you can see, they've got that silvery bit there, and that's the cathode. It's the same bit as the flat bit on the diagram. Now, to make a bridge rectifier really is a piece of cake. Just take two with the silvery bits pointing towards each other and twist them round. And then take two with the black bits pointing towards each other, so the silvery bits are there, and this time twist the black bits around. Now what we have to do is take the two that we made, connect them up like that, and twist them around. And that's it. When we soldered them together, we've made our bridge rectifier. It really is that simple. So I've opened it up into the little diamond shape so it looks just like the circuit diagram. You can have them in any orientation as it happens, but that one really works nicely and you can see what it actually is. Now, the connection to the motor goes here and here where we've got silver black. 
silver, black. That's where the AC input goes in, so your motor coil connects there. The output is from these two. Where we've got silver and silver together, that's the positive. Where we've got black and black together, that's the negative, which is kind of really easy, eh? Black, black, negative. Now, we could use it just like this, but actually, as a rectifier, it doesn't give a particularly smooth output. So we can put a capacitor on it to smooth that output. The capacitor not only smooths the output, if it's of high enough value, it will store energy, and so you get a much more even output. Now, I've got a 50-volt, 1,000 farad uh, capacitor here. It's just a normal electrolytic capacitor. You can put quite high farads on there. 5,000 would be just fine. Drop it down to 25 volts, just fine. I happen to have quite a bag full of these ones so that's the one I'm going to use and it, anything around there will work just great. Now when we connect it you'll notice the electrolytic has a negative sign on it telling you which side is negative. So the negative connects to the negative and the positive connects to the positive on the output so it's going to connect just like that and it'll do that on the other one as well. When we've done that these will be the outputs where we connect them together in series or parallel, one coil will go here, and then on the other one that we've made, that's where the other coil will go. So I'm just going to twist those round, solder them together, and you should put some heat shrink on there as well, just to make it all nice and neat and tidy. Okay, you can see what I've done. I've identified the two coils, and then I've taken one coil and soldered it onto here. Remember they're the AC inputs of our bridge rectifier, leaving the DC outputs alone, and across those DC outputs I've basically put a capacitor. And that's what it looks like, and here it is where I've finished it off. So I'll finish that one off. And there the two finished off. Now to connect these in series, you would take the negative and attach it to the positive, so that we have negative to positive like that. Then that obviously would be a negative out, and that's your positive out, so that's in series. To connect them in parallel, we connect both the negatives together and both the positives together, and that's in parallel. Now remember, in series, the voltage adds and the current remains the same. In parallel, the amps or current add and the voltage remains the same. So I've gone for a series connection, so I've connected negative and positive to each other of these ones, taken the negative out there and the positive out there, and I've chosen a black and red for obvious reasons, and here it is going to the NEMA stepper motor. So here it is connected up to the multimeter, it's reading a volt reading and I've connected a spindle on it just to make it easier to turn and if I just get my hand out of the way so you can read the voltage reading with no problem getting that up to 14-15 volts just turning it by hand. Now I've put a spindle on because you can buy this stuff. This is toothed belt, you can buy it in yards actually. That tooth belt fits on there so we could drive this from absolutely anything using a toothed belt on that spindle. Okay, so I've got five LEDs in a row attached to it. Let's give that a spin. <laughs> so there you go. How to convert a stepper motor into a generator. Now, when I was turning that, you might have noticed that the LEDs didn't light initially. And then when I stopped turning it, they stayed on for a long amount of time. That's the effect of the capacitors. The bigger those capacitors, then the longer that effect will be. So it'll take longer to charge, but it will last longer when you're not actually turning it. So if you stuck a couple of supercapacitors on there at 500 farads, it would take you a while to charge those up, but certainly it would last an awful long time when it was discharging, which I think is pretty cool and, and well worth experimenting with to really create something that meets your needs. These are awesome things to turn into generators and this is a bought NEMA and it's quite a large NEMA motor It's not brilliantly large, but it's quite large, but it's a bought motor and I did it deliberately because we can fit things to it But if you want to scavenge ne uh, stepper motors, they're all over the place Like I say, they're in CD-ROM drives, DVD-ROM drives, printers, CNC machines There's just a whole plus of places where you can get a decent stepper motor and then, of course, this, this is the kind of motor that's very often used in microgenerators, particularly the DIY microgenerators. Anyway, I thought I'd go through that because I think it's quite interesting. It should be useful, I hope, and I hope it sparks some ideas. And thank you very much for watching.